Hi, so like Mike said, um, I am Amberly. Uh, I just recently got uh, married, so now my last name is Peterson, in case you've known me as Nelson. But anyway, I am just super excited to be here today. I'm very passionate about this topic, and I brought my son, who's also passionate about this topic. And we're going to discuss it today in a way that we can break it down and understand uh, what cancel culture comes from, which is a big part of critical race theory, or CRT. And we're going to talk about that and several other aspects of this, this new uh, cultural war that we find ourselves in. So that's about me. I have seven children. I live in Salem. This is number four of seven, but he'll get into that. And I'm going to let him introduce himself, talk about what he's about, what he wants to talk about. And I think you're going to stand to do that. And then we will engage in a discussion. I've got lots of notes and books to share and resources for you. And we are going to unpack this so you finally understand what CRT is, why it's bad, and how we can combat it at home and nationally and amongst our friends and family because whether you know it or not, you've been probably engaging in conversations around these issues and haven't known it. You've just felt frustrated and wondered what the person is talking about. And so we're going to help you with that because this is the issue uh, du jour. This is the issue of the day right now. So, and I, and so the purpose now is to kind of backfill in with some information that is critical to know when he talked about what to do as far as school boards and, and your legislators. We first need to identify our enemy, and, and which is CRT, and, and more of this we'll get into wokeism and, and the religion of wokeism and what's happening here. But we really need to see our enemy for what it is so that we know which tack to take. Um, the best enemy is the one you don't see, right? So that's the purpose of today is to kind of fill in some of these blanks that he talked about. How many in here have heard of CRT or critical race theory? Great. Okay. Perfect. Um, and you're definitely the, the patriots and the ones ahead of your time because the truth is most Americans haven't heard of it. And yet, it is fast becoming, critical race theory, fast becoming the new institutional orthodoxy that we are dealing with. And so we need to know what that is and how to fight it. Uh, so first, we're going to just do a, a brief gloss over of explaining critical race theory because um, maybe the folks uh, getting the stream may not have heard about it or been aware of it. So let's just talk briefly about the history of Marxism in a sentence or two. So originally Marxism, Karl Marx, you remember him, he was, built his whole theory on, the, on, on, on class conflict. Okay? And so Karl Marx believed that the primary characteristic of industrial societies was the imbalance of power between capitalists and workers the poor and the rich. And the solution to that imbalance, according to Marx, was revolution. He believed that they needed to get the workers, the poor class, to, avenge, to gain consciousness of their horrible plight, seize the means of production, and then overthrow the capitalist or rich class, and usher in a new socialist society. And as you know, we, we've talked about this great. We talked about this a lot around the dinner table. There's been a number of regi regimes that have underwent this Marxist-style uh, revolution, and each of them ended in massive disaster, massive loss of life. I mean, from the Soviet Union to China to Cambodia, Cuba, these regimes packed up a body count of nearly 100 million. So basically, Marxism represents and embodies man's darkest brutalities. Um, and it is out of this that critical race theory was born. So it's basically Marxism, neo-Marxism as it's called, actually, neo means new, new Marxism, that has just reared its ugly head again. And why? Because it's the age-old script from mankind forevermore. And so now we're seeing it in this rebranded CRT, or critical race theory, and we need to see it for what it is. So eventually, this framework, this political framework, um, it resurged in the 1990s amongst academics in colleges and, and universities. And um, it infiltrated every university in the Western world. And, but now it's spread, like he said, it doesn't stay in classrooms. It is now spread into all our public institutions, including all of our government agencies, our public school systems, teacher training programs, corporate human resource departments in the form of diversity training programs, human resource modules, policy frameworks, and school curricula. And we're going to talk a lot about that too because um, that's where we can really get involved. So basically, critical race theory critiques our modern culture and challenges the underlying power structures of society. And it is a movement to, quote, liberate, this is the irony, this is, this is, their, this is their mantra, this is their belief, to liberate human beings from the circumstances that enslave them. Well, now that sounds noble, right? Well, until you define what the circumstances that they're slaving them are, enslaving them are. And that's where the danger comes in. Um, because what they do is they turn that narrative into a story of the oppressor and the oppressed. 
There's only two people, there's only two societies, two, two classes, if you will, in, in, our, in our culture now, in our country. It's the oppressed or the oppressor. Now, guess which one you're in? <laughs> you're considered the oppressors. Every, everyone in this room, right? And um, because you're one or the other, and there's no middle ground. But what's, what's interesting, and what the big hole in this theory is, the, the big, the big you know, catch-22, if you will, is that um, whichever group you land in is not based on your merit, your thoughts, your beliefs. It's based on what you were born with, identi identity. He kept talking about identity politics. That's what he means by that. That's the, the, the term here, is that, is that politics based around, around an identity, an identity that you cannot change. You were born with, including your, your race, your sex and your gender identity. Those are the three big hot buttons that every line in the sand is drawn now between. Between the two sexes, right? Between a gender identity, what's that? And between uh, races. And so, to, to kind of give a little bit more background on this, in critical race theory, the only things that exist are hierarchies of power. And those hierarchies of power must be torn down by the oppressed. We must let the oppressed know how horrible their plight is because that will galvanize them to tear down all power structures, all hierarchies. And so the goal of this movement, uh, whether they state it out loud or not, but it is, is nothing less than the complete dismantling and rebuilding of, cultural, of Western culture from the ground up. And in order to accomplish this tearing down, CRT, first, and that's what I'm going to use, critical race theory, CRT, first they had to establish themselves as the primary moral culture within our society. That's the first step. They have to, they have to identify, we're the moral culture now. And that's been accomplished. And then they had to draw the lines of separation between the oppressors and the oppressed. And that's been accomplished. Um, like I said, and those lines are between the race, sex, and gender identity. Now, how do they do this? Well, they're masters of language construction. Marxism, all revolutionary, everything has to, the first thing they have to do to soften the ground, to, 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 to prepare the ground for a, a revolution is to hijack words that we have an understanding of in a general sense. They hijack these words and co-opt them for their agenda. So it's confusing. We think they're talking about one thing, but really they're talking about another. That is the first thing they do. You think going back to the Tower of Babel, you know, the first way to really kind of, you know, destroy a society is to change the language, right? So he's, he used those words up there, and maybe you're not even aware of them, but uh, social justice, that's a huge one. We're going to talk about that. Wokeism, we're going to talk about um, uh, some of those other words that, uh, equity, equity is a big one. We're going to talk about that. Um, and I'm going to have James uh, chip in on that because chime in on that because it's important. But let's talk about, for example, um, and, and the reason they have to they have to uh, employ these euphemisms for what they're really doing is again to soften it to make it look okay. Like, for example, um, gambling is no longer called gambling; it's called gaming. Um, you know, abortion is no longer called abortion. A lot of times, it's called uh, pro-choice. I mean, anything to make it sound benevolent. Right? And so that's, that's, the, that's what they do. And so let's, because if they stand up in, on the roofs and yell, neo-Marxism, neo-Marxism, who's going to listen to them? That's a hard sell. Nobody wants neo-Marxism. So instead, let's call it something else. And so one of, again, there's a couple things they call it. They call it equity. Well, that sounds like a great word, right? Social justice, diversity and inclusion. Oh, gosh, we, we want to be diverse and inclusive, right? Uh, culturally responsive teaching. Oh, that sounds great. None of those are great because they've just co-opted these words. So again, let's just talk about equity real quick and then we need to discuss that. But equity, well that sounds like a non-threatening word and, it's in, and in fact, they picked that word because it's easy to confuse with equality. But there's a vast difference between equity and equality. Okay, and this is a perfect example of how this happens. Equality, the principle proclaimed in the Declaration of Independence, defended in the Civil War, and codified into law with the 14th and 15th Amendments, along with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights of 1865, all based on equality. Very important, very important benevolent virtue given to us from God. But that word, equality, is explicitly rejected by CRT theorists. Equality, um, in, in back, going back up, okay, remember, equality is a foundation in our Judeo-Christian society because, again, we believe that God sees all men as equal in his sight, and thus all men have an equal right to protect the freedoms he endows us with. That's equality. But 
CR to CRT activists, equality represents mere non-discrimination and provides camouflage for white supremacy, patriarchy, and oppression. So, in, in, in contrast to equality though, equity is therefore what they come in with, and it's defined and promoted by critical race theorists as basically uh, Marx's point two. In the so, let me give you an example. In the name of equity, you've probably heard of this, UCLA professor, law professor and CRT theorist, Cheryl Harris, so this is what equity is to CRT people. Um, has proposed suspending private property rights for everybody, seizing land and wealth, and redistributing them along racial lines. So take from the white supremacists and redistribute amongst the black people, because therefore we would now create equity. Well, so again, to reemphasize, equity in this approach is taking from one who has more and giving it to one who has less. Does that sound familiar? Is that not socialism to at its core? And, and here's my question. Who exactly gets to decide what more is and what less is? Oh, let me guess, the government. And how subjective is that process? In fact, that's what they're actually proposing. This critical race guru that he talked about, Ibram X. Kendi uh, at Boston University, has propo proposed the creation of a federal department of anti-racism. This department, federal, federal government, would be independent, completely unaccountable to the elected branches of government and would have the power to nullify, veto, or abolish any law at any level of government and, cur and curtail the speech of political leaders and anyone he deems insufficiently anti-racist. You want to talk about what anti-racist means uh, in the scheme of this? It's no longer racist. It's you're either racist, again, there's only two, there's only two divisions in this country. You're either racist or you're anti-racist. Yeah, <clears throat> so I, it's funny because most of the anti-racist arguments are inherently racist. <laughs> So anti-racism and the arguments about anti-racism are about outcomes. So not, they're never, it's always about the ends and not about the means. So for instance, um, like I said, with, with Asian students scoring higher than African Americans or Latino students, right? People who are anti-racist would say that it is racist to, for, to allow these Asian students to excel at Harvard in, because it creates disparities in between in between minorities, or for instance, you look at Oregon. Oregon school, Oregon Department of Education has just suspended uh, testing across the board for students for reading and math and writing because they want to end disparities in between these racial groups. So it's a complete racialization of every aspect of society in order to achieve what they see as a more utopian outcome and what they prefer. So. They use the term anti-racist and they hide behind it because it really is incredibly racist. It's incredibly racist and it's it's Marxist and and here's what's really scary about it, folks, is that you, you have an entire party in America, the Democratic Party. Kamala Harris doesn't actually believe this. She she's what what those people are is they're cynical and they're using it to use power. They want to be able to campaign on racism to solve racism so that they can use their power to achieve what they really want. Joe Biden doesn't actually care about solving racism. He doesn't actually care about that. He wants to use that and the anti-racist philosophy to achieve his policy ends and to accumulate more power and more control over our lives. Yes, that's perfect. And so that's why, um, in fact, again, this, this uh, Kendi, this Ibram Kendi, um, basically said <laughs> that the result of creating that government institution that he believes uh, the anti-racial uh, you know, what is he calling it? The, the, the yeah, the um, the his little group there. That it's in order to be truly anti-racist. To, to be truly anti-racist, you also have to be truly anti-capitalist. So, in other words, anti-racism is the means to the Marxist end. It's always going back to that. It's anything to do to get us back to Marxism. And so, basically, this equity-based form of government would mean not only the end of private property, but also of individual rights, equality under the law, which our Declaration of Independence gives us, and as, as, as does our um, Constitution, freedom of speech, and these would all be replaced by race-based redistribution, redistribution of wealth, group-based rights. Um, and this omnipotent bureaucratic authority who gets to decide what is more, what is less, who gets what, who gets, it's the absolute embodiment of anti-Americanism. You couldn't get any more, more anti-Americanism or anti-American than that. And so 
Okay, that's that on the government level. Unfortunately, it doesn't even end there. They've also, it's not just in the political arena, it's not just amongst universities and education, they've, at, they've also uh, co-opted major concepts that are foundational to all, to all cultures, which are, they've, they've co-opted logic, science and reason, turning them from cornerstones of education and enlightenment into tools of the oppressive white patriarchy. We're going to get into that, what they've done with math. You're going to, you're, you, this will blow your mind. But, uh, so I want to talk about that. But, um, so they've, they've, they've taken those, logic, science, and reason. And then they've also taken values like individualism, hard work, punctuality, and delayed gratification. Those things that are all good for anybody, regardless of race, religion, anything. All those values are good and helpful. But now, in the CRT theory that we're talking about here, those are viewed as hallmarks of perpetuating white supremacy. So they warn their, their, their mm -hmm. workers and their people in their, to watch out for these. You yeah. want to talk about that? Yeah, well, I watched a documentary on Netflix recently. It's about uh, how to become a, a dictator, right? And it wasn't actually advising people how to become a dictator. It was, it was basically taking historical dictators and understanding how they came to power. And one thing that, that I found really interesting about Stalin is that Stalin first, he, he removed all past monuments that were constructed during any other era. So he canceled any other philosophy that you could possibly have. He took over uh, the, the, all the academies and he, for instance, when, when it came to planting, when it came to farmers, he, he would be based their entire farm uh, philosophy based off of Marxist ideas. So for instance, they try to invent seeds that could be planted during the winter because that was more of a Marxist seed than a capitalist seed because capitalists had invented the seed that could be invent that could be planted during the summer. And so like what you were talking about with, with them taking over math and taking over those uh, those values and institutions, it in any other day and age, if you said these are about these inherently American values are just white values and they're using to perpetuate white supremacy. Well, then in any other era, we'd say that that is blatantly racist and because and, anti-racist ideas are inherently racist. But because we live in this woke age, this, 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 cynicist, this cynical age, that students are willing to buy that because there's so much information out there, right? I, one of my professors of communication said that when there's a wealth of information, there's a poverty of attention. And so students are falling for this because they go on TikTok, Facebook, Google, Instagram, and they have these billions of algorithms that are inventing other algorithms that are perpetuating a certain philosophy on these kids. And so I see kids my age and on my team who are afraid to believe in things and take stands on things, and this kind of goes away from, from Marxism, but kind of speaks to society in general, is that they're afraid to actually believe in anything because they go on any of these platforms and they find five billion different outlets for how that could be wrong. So they're afraid to stand up for what's, what's, just what's basically right, like there's only two genders, there's male and female. But now we have to get training at my school where it's like, okay, well, how are you feeling today? Do you feel like a woman today? Do you feel like a man today? And if you if you disagree with them, then, then you're oh you're you're transphobic, you're you're a racist, you're you're toxic. So really, I, I think that the reason why we're that we're allowing this to spread is because young people, like kind of like what I refer to in my speech, is that they're allowing these. These social media companies to make them more cynical and, and make them for just forget because all you have to do to really push this kind of revolution is get the most important people like my generation, the young people, to just forget because mm. kind of like the quote that all, you, all evil has to do to, to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Well, in this country, all we have to do, all they have to do is get us to forget mm. basic principles and basic ideas of this country that has made this so great. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to do is make students aware that, that you have to just, it, we don't have to teach them anything new. We just have to make sure that they remember and don't forget this country. Yes, oh, great, great. Can you tell us that quote again? A uh, wealth of information. A wealth of information leads to a poverty of attention. Poverty of intention. Attention. Of attention. attention. A -T -T. Yeah, great, great comments there, absolutely. Um, so now we're going to talk about how they're actually implementing these, these ideas and the CRT and, and at what level. So I'm just going to do a couple examples. And, and most of this is coming from, um, well, several articles. I'm going to talk about some books. But there was an Imprimus article um, called Critical Race Theory. 
um, in March of 2021, What It Is and How to Fight It, by Christopher Rufo, and he's a, 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 a founder and director of um, a, pub, a, public, a public policy research center, graduate of uh, Georgetown University, and he's just a really bright guy. He sheds a lot of light on this, and I'm really pulling a lot from his article, just so you know. Can you give us that name? Yes, it's um, Imprimus, uh, Critical Race Theory, What It Is and How to Fight It, by Christopher Rufo. So he did a documentary and he documented some of the ways that this is happening and he, and he tells us this. The Treasury Department, so this is going to how it's being implemented and, and infused into the government level. The Treasury Department held a training session telling staff members that virtually all white people contribute to racism and they must convert everyone in the federal government to the ideal ideology of anti-racism, which is actually racism as, Joseph, as James uh, just taught us. And the Sandia National Laboratories, which designs America's nuclear arsenal, sent white male executives to a three-day re-education camp, where they were told that white male culture was analogous to the KKK, white supremacists, and mass killings. The executives were then told, uh, forced to renounce their white male privilege and write letters of apology to fictitious women and people of color. Rufo also documented what was happening in education across the country and found this. In Cupertino, California, an elementary school, let's see, back up here, um, let's see, no, I just go down here, okay. In Cupertino, California, uh, right here, an elementary school forced first graders, first graders, to deconstruct their racial and sexual identities and rank themselves according to their power and privilege. Can you imagine a seven-year-old trying to figure out, uh, what, my, my power and privilege? I, can I just go to recess now? I mean, this is ridiculous, right? In Springfield, Missouri, a middle school, middle school forced teachers to allocate themselves on an oppression matrix based on the ideas that straight, white, English-speaking Christian males are members of the oppressor class and must atone for their privilege and their covert white supremacy. One more. In Philadelphia, an elementary school forced fifth graders to celebrate black communism and to simulate a black power rally, rally to free 1960s radical Angela Davis from prison, where she had once been held on charges of murder. People, these are fifth graders simulating black communism, black power. And in Seattle, the school district told white teachers that they are guilty of spirit murder against black children, and they must bankrupt their privilege and acknowledgement of their thieved inheritance. So Rufo, Rufo goes on to say, look, I'm just one investigative journalist, but I've developed a database of more than a thousand of those stories I just shared. He has more than a thousand. He said, when I say that critical race theory is becoming the operating ideology of our public institutions, it is not an exaggeration. From the bureaucracy, bureaucracies to K-12 school systems, critical race theory has permeated the collective intelligence and decision-making process of American government with no sign of slowing down. Okay, now I want to talk really briefly about math. I was sharing this with him on the way over. Uh, I got an article the other day from National Review, and you'll want to write this one down. National Review, it's called The Folly of Woke Math. And we're gonna get more into the word woke because that's a big word, and James can talk a lot about that too. Um, because in fact, that's another euphemism uh, employed by the CTR crowd, CRT crowd. But in this, in this National Review article, National Review, the folly of woke math. This is what we learn, and I just put tiny little snippets. The, whole, the article's amazing, it'll blow your mind, but I'm gonna give you just a couple little talking points here. Here's what it says. Deborah, Deborah Lowenberg Ball, a mathematics professor and former dean of the University of Michigan School of Education. This woman's a big hitter, right? Well, this is what she claims. That math proficiency is white supremacy. In the latest episode of a podcast, she complains that math is, quote, a harbor for whiteness. And the very nature of the knowledge and who's produced it and what is counted as mathematics is itself dominated by whiteness and racism. A book in 2017 written by Rochelle Gutierrez, another, another CTR proponent and professor of Uni University of Illinois says, quote, on many levels, mathematics itself operates as whiteness. Who gets credit for doing and developing mathematics? Who is capable in mathematics and who is seen as part of the mathematical community is generally white. So she worries that algebra and geometry perpetuate privilege 
and because society's premium on math skills creates unearned privilege for math professors who are disproportionately white. Anyway, it goes on and on. You just have to read it. But the, but the bottom line is they came up with a solution. Imagine that. And, here, and they're getting paid a lot of money for this solution, which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, of course. But it's a program called A Pathway to Equitable Math Instruction. And it's aimed at grades 6 through 8. California has adopted this, you guys. And this is what, this is how they, this is, this is their description of themselves. It's called a, path, um, a Pathway to Equitable Math Instruction. Um, and in this pathway, this is how it explains its purpose. This is them talking about themselves. This tool provides teachers an opportunity to examine their actions, beliefs, and values around teaching mathematics. The framework for deconstructing racism in mathematics offers essential characteristics of anti-racist math educators and critical approaches to, to dismantling white supremacy in math classrooms by making visible the toxic characteristics of white supremacy culture with respect to math. So it goes on and on, but uh, they go on to say that they need to, th this pathway is the way to avoid paternalism and power hoarding, and that teachers, get this, should stop teaching math. It, that is their stated, stated purpose, is to get teachers to stop teaching math, and instead, the teachers are to learn from their students. <laughs> yes, no, but, but, but not math. No, this has nothing to do with math. The teachers aren't trying to learn math from their students, of course. What the teachers are to explicitly learn from their students is um, that good math is not about learning. It is about uh, eliminating inequity. And so instead of using numbers to teach math, uh, pathway advocates in schools are to use numbers to motivate anti-racist discussions of social justice. So they're supposed to use their time in math classroom to teach the teacher the kids are to teach the teacher about anti-racism and the fact that, uh, and then to have social justice dis uh, discussions. And so, uh, yeah, that's how we're going to do that. Now, um, is that, <laughs> does that blow your mind? I, I hope it does because I had to learn math and I'm so grateful I did and I'll tell you why. I had seven kids. I had to keep track of them. I had to be able to count them. Right? Um, I had to make recipes I, you know, uh, at night and, uh, you know, for dinner, and I might have to add a fourth a cup and a half a cup, and that's math. Oh, yes? It's ultimately aimed to destroy critical thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because critical thinking would start. Critical thinking now. That's right. Because to have yeah. critical. Th system. That's right. Critical thinkers will challenge it. Well, um, well for instance, this, this is actually incredibly disturbing. The, the, um, Museum for, Nat for um, African American History in Washington, D.C. I visited it before. This last uh, summer, I believe, that they released, um, kind of what my mother alluded to earlier, um, white values and African American values. And for the white values, they had critical thinking and individualism and, and pioneering mindset and, and self-determination. And, and so, really, it, it, because their ideas are so bad that they have to destroy critical thinking. They have to destroy it because no idiot can actually fall for that if they have two brains. I mean, if they have two cells in their brain. Um, so, it, like I said, it, it's not it, it's not predicated their ideas on actual uh, consistent uh, philosophical thought process. What it's really based on is power because they just want power. That's all they want, and they're going to use whatever they can to use it. And because these people are so cynical and, and not and because they're so miserable. You have to understand that these people truly are miserable because to, per, to, to be a proponent of this idea is to actually be racist and to be so miserable with yourself as Satan's workers usually are that, that, they're, purport, that they're trying to support this and promote it among kids and among children. That's how, that's how depraved they really are. And so they have to use these woke terms like like, like, like struggle, like, like gender identity, and they, they don't really care. They just want power, and they're going to try to enforce it any way they possibly can. Um, that's why, for instance, they don't tolerate free speech on on, camp, on college campuses. They won't allow you to have free speech because I know that if my professor asks me, I can I can go right to the heart of the matter and I can end the discussion there and then. And that's why Abraham Lincoln said that e evil can't stand a discussion. So as long as I can shut us up and prevent us from speaking about this, then it will continue to permeate throughout society. But what's been so magnificent is that we've been seeing a lot of mothers go to school board meetings 
And I don't know if you've seen those videos, but they're standing up and they're putting their foot down and they're saying, hell no, we're not gonna allow this. And that's what we have to do. Or else these ideas will continue to, to stay alive. Absolutely, so it's the parent activists. That's you, that's us, that's me. That's grandparent activists. In fact, he mentioned the school board. I had my little, uh, my, my day with the school board. Uh, it wasn't on video, uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately. It was one of my better days. <laughs> but uh, I had showed up, we were gonna, it was down in Ebel School District. They were gonna talk about CRT. So we sat there calmly, about 30 of his parents, there waiting for that to come up with the agenda. And when it came up at the end, they said, now we're gonna move uh, this discussion to a private back room with just us, you know, the, the school board. And we all started saying, excuse me, wait, we, we've waited our turn, what are you, what are you talking about? We've, we've waited here respectfully and would, nope, nope, we, we feel like we need to discuss it privately. And I, that went back and forth for a little bit and finally, because they told us that for several months, finally I stood up and walked down the aisle and got about six feet away from their little platform <laughs> and I let them have it. And I just called it out for what it is. This is neo-Marxism. We're not going to put up with it. Uh, we know what this is. We're not swallowing this. We're, gonna, we're going to de you know, decry this at every turn. And then they didn't want to hear from me, like James said, so they started packing up their laptops and stuff, putting them in their bags because they were going to leave regardless. Um, they were too afraid to have this conversation for the reasons James just talked about. And so as they did, wrapped up, I finally just looked at them each in the eye. There was, I think, six of them. And I just said, you're a coward. You're a coward because you can't have this discussion. And yet our children's lives and our future are at stake. And you won't even have this discussion with us. So uh, that's what I said and a lot more. But <laughs> you guys, uh, any chance you have to speak out about, about this, and we're going to get into that next, this last part that I have, which is what we can do. But any chance you have to speak out on this, you need to. And just before we move on, I do want to talk about real quick the fact that, again, going back to this math as a basic foundational need for society. Um, how about this? Do you know that every year seven to 9,000 Americans die from math errors in their medication dosage? I mean, seven to 9,000 people. That's just who they you know, track. But I mean, what job from a pharmacist to a beautician to anybody doesn't use math? How do we, how do we, make that a racist issue and remove that from our children. They need that math. Yes? How do you get the school board out? If, if, they, if they won't listen, how do you get them out? You continue to email them and let them know that you are going to vote them out. And when it comes time to vote, you do vote them out. You get, uh, so it's, it's about getting everybody to vote them out? Yes. Absolutely. So show up to your school board meetings and you'll start to network. That's what I did when I was there. I saw, you know, 30 people. We took each other's emails. We were like, okay, let's, let's do this. Yeah. And I think it's really important because there are, there are some good, well-intentioned people who are on those school boards. They're just vitally misinformed. And this is perpetrated through good intentions, right? Because who doesn't want to be against racism? Who doesn't want to fight against evil? Who, do, who, who wants to fight for oppression, right? Who, who doesn't want to liberate people, as it says in those documents? So for you, for just a more practical sort of resource and outlet, um, there are a lot of websites that you can go on that shows you uh, the voting patterns of certain people who are on the board. It shows you their districts. It shows you what they're voting on when they're meeting. They have Facebook groups. They have websites. So find out what they're voting for, how they're voting, and then if you want to vote them out, which you probably should do if they're voting for critical race theory and that type of stuff, is organize and uh, even just among a neighbor, among a neighborhood. Pass out flyers. Pass out leaflets. Let your neighbors know what's really going on, and I promise you that they will support you. Yep. Agreed. In fact, Natalie Klein. Oh, yes. Joseph Smith said in the Joseph Smith teachings that his greatest fear would be that the saints would become apathetic. Yes, absolutely. And I think that uh, I, I'm from California, California originally, and I'm probably quite a rebel there. But when I did live here in Utah for a little bit of time, I went out and lobbied at the Capitol. Oh, neat. We can lobby. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we can do a lot of things. I have picketed, yep. I have mm -hmm. done all kinds of stuff. And if we are going to be apathetic in all of this, mm -hmm. I love passing flyers around yep. our neighbors. Yep. yep. You know, uh, we just can. great. Do what any in your place that you are. Do anything you can. Um, I just told me there was a school board that well, there was a school district where the teachers were teaching. Pornographic mm -hmm. mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. using Disney characters. It was just so yep. awful. Yep. And, and the mayor came and said, 
you will all resign or you're going to jail. Yeah. Good. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, Awareness Ohio. needs to be, that was where in Ohio? In Ohio. Yes. Yeah. Did you have a comment too? Is that, yes. My name is Larry Scanson. One of the things that you're talking about, voting, we have to realize what's going on. If you heard of what happened during the Trump, the vote team, hammer and scorecard are being implemented at the lowest levels. You know what I'm saying when I say hammer and scorecard? Yes. No. Okay, no. those are my friends that wrote the story on, on the computer system that can enter any network and never be tracked. Mm -hmm. And they can transfer, every time votes transfer, 3% of the vote. So when you look at how this works, that means 10 to 15% of the vote gets, can be swapped almost automatically. And, and the school boards, they found in the primaries were where they really did it to make sure that those candidates were selected or to even choose from. So we have a, big, a bigger issue even mm -hmm. on top mm -hmm. of what you're saying there, mm -hmm. that this has to be understood. Anybody yeah. wants to listen or learn about it under the Two Mics podcast, it's not me, so I don't know. <laughs> but those are the friends that broke it, General McInerney and such. Nice. So I'm just saying. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. That's great. It goes to show how deep the corruption goes, and I appreciate that because that is so true. So in our, in our time remaining, we want to go through kind of more specifics. We just talked a little bit there about how to combat this, what works and what doesn't. So let's just talk about really quickly what has kind of stopped us or what hasn't worked. And James talked about that, but too many Americans are, have developed a fear of speaking out. Because why? Uh, you're afraid that you're going to get bomb, bomb, you know, blasted on Facebook or your neighbors will stop talking to you. You'll get mobbed on social media, fired from your jobs. But that's not good enough. We must stand up. We must speak out because what that does is it's, it's, it's contagious. Other people start speaking out too, encourage, and this starts to swell. So be that one voice and other people will come to you and be like, oh, I feel the same way. So number one. Second of all, the critical race theorists have constructed their argument like a mousetrap and they want to bait you into it. Here's their mousetrap. When you try to, uh, when you disagree with their program or anything they're trying to say, Oh, that's irrefutable evidence that your, uh, your white fragility is causing this and you have an unconscious bias and your internalized white supremacy is now coming out for all of us to see. So see how they've trapped you? By trying to defend yourself, they're using that as, oh, that's you defending your white supremacy and you're just, you know, we've triggered you and now you're, you're defensive, you feel embarrassed, you're shameful of it. Um, so you don't do that. You don't, you can't prove you're not a racist, you guys. You can't prove an, a negative. So you can't, you can't take that approach. Instead, you take courage, you step up out of the fray, and you talk to your neighbors, and you do what you can with the school board and our votes, and you, and you still put your posts on Facebook. But don't get baited into that. You have to prove yourself, prove you're not a racist. It, it, it's a conundrum, and they've trapped you there. So don't do that. Um, and also, third, um, or, uh, lastly, or yeah, third on this, um, we have to approach them with the facts, okay? So in other words, when they start going at you with this, go, at a, go back at them with, a pragmatic, with pragmatic questions like, for example, okay, I, I hear your point. You can always be peaceful, right? You can, you can hold your peace and uh, you don't have to get contentious, but you need to ask questions like, oh, okay, so do you support public schools separating first graders to groups, into groups of oppressors and oppressed? Do, do you support that? Now, no thinking person would say yes, so it puts them back on the, oh wait, uh, I don't, I know, I don't think I do. Or how about you ask them this, do you support man, uh, mandatory curricula teaching that all white people play a part in, this, in perpetuating this systemic racism? Do you support public schools instructing white parents to become white traitors and advocate for white abolition? That's what they're asking parents to do, become white traitors. How's that? Or you know the managers and workers in corporate America, and to and to tell on your neighbors, and to turn people in, and and uh, every one of us. So, so we need to take pragmatic questions back at them like that, and then of course they'll backpedal, right? Um, okay. So and then finally the last one is we need to employ our own moral language. Okay, instead of trying to talk their language and do our own, and instead of talking about diversity and debating what diversity is. Talk about excellence. Say, let's just have a standard of excellence. Instead of having how much diversity do you have here, what's your standard of excellence? Because everybody can strive for a standard of excellence, right? And so, and then finally, uh, one more thing I guess to add is that we need to continue to tell the true story of this country. We must promote the true story of America. A story that is honest about our injustices in American history. Yes, we have our, 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 our ugliness. 
every country and society does. But let's learn from it. Let's put it in the context of, okay, we, we had that time, we've had the civil, era, uh, civil war, we've had our civil rights era, we've had these things. Let's learn from them and use as a springboard to become better and to realize higher, higher goals and higher ways. So our history is rich. I mean, James talks about this. We talked about it around the dinner table. Our history is rich with stories of achievements and sacrifices that will move the hearts of Americans um, in stark contrast to, like he said, the grim and pessimistic, cynical narrative that is pressed by these critical race theorists. Um, and above all, we must have courage, the fundamental virtue required in our time. James talked about it in his speech, and I, I love that part. Courage to stand up and speak the truth. Courage to withstand epithets and name calling. Courage to face the mob. Courage to shrug, shrug off the scorn of the elites. When enough of us overcome the fear that currently prevents so many of us from speaking out, the hold that they have on this and the critical race theory will begin to slip. It's only getting its way and, and, and making progress because we're staying silent. We must stand up every time we see it. Courage begets cur uh, courage. Um, it's one thing to stop 10 or 20 or 100 people, but when a million people stand up together for the principles of America, we can't be stopped. So truth and justice are on our side, and if we can muster the courage, we will win. And I just wanted to say, first of all, um, you guys have already passed the test for having the, the will to, to do something. You guys are already here, you guys, are at, you guys want to have information, right? And I would remind, there's a quote that I love that I, that I heard a long time ago that I never forget. Because I, I oftentimes find myself alone in debating friends on politics and on, on gender theory and, and stuff like that. And it's that one person with the truth makes a majority. And if you speak the truth more and more and more, people can't, like, like it says in the Book of Mormon, that, that the light of Jesus Christ lives in all of us, right? All of us are rational people. And when truth enters into your, into your brain, you can't help but recognize it. Um, and I like... For myself, I, I, I said, I, I debate a lot of people, I debate my friends, and one of the reasons why I still have friends who disagree with me vehemently, one of my best friends uh, at my school has a big Black Lives Matter flag in his room, and uh, I have a good time kind of joking at it with him. Um, but never let people doubt that you have just the best intentions. Let them know that you love your country because of the principles of this country. If, for instance, I talk about how I want a southern border wall, right? But in presenting that argument, I say, it's not because I hate the people coming in, it's just that I love the country that they're trying to come into and they can come in here, but there has to be some sort of process. And so we have to be able to communicate with people who are on the other side of the aisle with us, who might just have, uh, they might have a good heart, just a, just a different opinion than us. And we have to have the patience and the virtue to be able to say, Look, I just think we should do it a different way. We don't have to always get, I think that being fired up is a really good thing, but we also have to work with people and work with them across the aisle sometimes. And so to those of, to those of you in this room, I really thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, seeing people, not, not all of you are my age, I guess, but seeing people who are willing to stand up for this country really gives me hope in the future of this country. And as long as we speak truth to those who seek to silence us and shut us up and we will win in the end so thank you very much okay so just real quick housekeeping um two really great books if you really want to dive into this they're fabulous critical well it's called cynical theories by helen pluckrose and james Lindsay. and then this other one is by a good friend of mine irresistible revolution and it's about how the crt came in and it demoralized our army our troops and what has happened there and that's a really great read so thank you very much